hack into cybersecurity? There's a ton of content out there, and if you don't know where to start, it can be overwhelming, even paralyzing. So let's fix that. Welcome to Simply Cyber, a community of tens of thousands of aspiring and active cybersecurity professionals focused on networking, knowledge sharing, and professional development. I'm Dr. Gerald Dozier, Chief Content Creator at Simply Cyber, inviting you to get the answers to your cybersecurity problems with hundreds of cybersecurity videos answering your frequently asked questions, interviewing industry experts, and live streaming daily cyber threat briefings hosted by me. Now get the stories and insights you won't find anywhere else. Hit subscribe now and dig into all the fresh content on the channel and in the community. Nothing should stop you from launching and leveling up your cybersecurity career today. Good morning, folks. Welcome to the show. Welcome. It is Monday, start of a whole new week, September 11th, 2023, episode 448 of Simply Cyber's Daily Cyber Threat Briefing. I'm your host, Dr. Gerald Dozier, and over the next 45 minutes, but let's be real, it'll be an hour and then 30 minutes of jaw jacking. Me, you, Marcus Kyler, Frank P., James McQuiggan back in the hot seat, Tom Bishop, Paul S., Khalil, Matthew Necci with the 15-month spot, Ben Howard, all the folks like Kerry and Eric Jordan on LinkedIn, James Adekudo. If you're on LinkedIn, if you're on YouTube, if you're a long timer or you're a first timer, you're gonna all be getting the top cybersecurity news stories of the day and I'll be giving my expert opinion and analysis on each of those stories on what it means to you as a practitioner. So how can you operationalize this tactically today? What's up, Jide? Or if you're going to implement it in your longer term strategic vision, either way, you're gonna wanna know this information because it's going to help you drive cyber risk reduction for your business and stakeholders. And if you're cyber curious, just breaking into the industry, maybe uh, applying for jobs, not sure if you even want to work here, believe me, there's massive value for you here. This is like a Sunday brunch. This is a buffet table at the Golden Corral. We got something for everybody here. And believe me, newcomers, if you're going to you're going to get asked in any job interview, um, for cyber. How do you stay current in the industry? The Daily Cyber Threat Brief podcast is a mic drop type answer. Believe that. In addition, you're going to hear all sorts of terminology, concepts, names, um, you know, the way they all interrelate with each other, geopolitical, macro level, micro level. The networking is next level. James McQuiggan dropping a 10 spot. Oh, is it James? McQu it is James, right? Hold on. I saw James. I, I assume it's James McQuiggan. Hold on, I can't, I don't want to say it's James McQuiggan and then it not be James McQuiggan. That would be, that would be terrible, terrible. All right, it is James McQuiggan. James McQuiggan dropping a 10 bomb on the squad members. Thanks so much, James. If you're one of the lucky 10 recipients of James's gifted membership, do say thank you to James and be sure to get into that squad emote tray because there's a lot of goodies in there, including Oprah, because you get cyber help. You get cyber help. You get a squad membership. You get a squad membership. All right, guys, it's going to be epic. Guys, be sure to say what's up in chat. If you want to get CPEs or continuing professional education credits, each episode's worth half a CPE, two and a half a week, 10 a month. Hashtag team live if you're with us right now. CPEs are only if you currently hold cybersecurity certifications that require you to maintain them with CPEs. That's the only use case. Hashtag team live if you're live with us. I see 157 of you beautiful people. I'm sure that we're going to continue to climb that ladder as the show continues on. We've been averaging 300 plus a show. I don't see why today would be any different. If you're on replay, hashtag team replay, replay people are people too. And I love myself some team replay. What's up, Chris Weaver? Thanks again for all the time marks. I love pinning those and helping everybody expedite their consumption of the top cyber news. If it is your first time on the podcast, Believe me, you missed Friday, which is a gem because my throat was about to get tore out of my th out of my throat. Growing the network by leaps and bounds, TJ Zimmer. Love it, love it, love it. All right, guys. Uh, if it's your first time, do me a favor. Hashtag first timer in chat. Let us know what's up. The chat is lively. The stories are hot. 
the you know everything about this show is on fire i also want to remind you that it is monday every single day of the week has one special unique segment today is callan's art of the week my son callan developed some piece of art over the weekend and shares it with the community and i'm happy to include him in the daily cyber threat brief podcast and we've got a big piece of art today for you But stay tuned for that. Before we get into it, I do want to say shout out and thanks to the stream sponsors that enable me to bring this show to you every single weekday morning. Starting with Barricade Cyber Solutions. Barricade Cyber Solutions is dedicated to helping get out of here. Is dedicated to helping businesses from cyber attacks and recover from the damage done. Cyber attacks can cause massive issues for businesses and send dedicated, hardworking business owners into turmoil. But guess what, James McQuiggan? Guess what, Cyberoon? Jess Bishop, guess what, Marcus Kyler? Barricade Cyber Solutions knows how to mitigate the damage done by cyber incidents. Believe that. Check them out at barricadecyber.com. TJ Zimmer with the gifted subs. If you're one of those 10, be sure to say thanks to TJ and enjoy those squad emotes. Also want to say shout out and love to my man, Brandon Poole at Panopsi Security, which I might also add. I shared over the weekend. I am now an advisory board member at Panopsi Security. So completely unrelated, um, the fact that they sponsor and my advisory role position. But, you know, woo, like I get to celebrate wins too, right? All right. So I'm, I've am i picked up another role um, as an advisory board member at Panopsi. So Panopsi Security, get a partner who understands your cyber program and your business goals. Listen, let's be real. People who are protecting organizations, they're typically light, light on money, light on resources, light on talent, light on um, time. So how do you prioritize what you're supposed to focus on? How do you go for that low hanging, high risk reduction items? And how do you have a long term plan that you can report to the board or report to the executives in a meaningful way? Well, if you don't know the answer to that question, that's what Panopsi does. They come in, they look at your people, process, technology, your threat landscape, how much money you got, how much time you got, and then they put it in a blender, push the special sauce uh, mixing button, and out pops a one to three year quantified risk assessment roadmap. It's, you know, nails. This is what they do, and they're very good at it. If you need something like that, consider Panopsi Cyber for your InfoSec program maturity needs. Now, I want to say what's up to my buddies over at Anti-Siphon Training as well. Guys, if you don't know, this is a big week for Anti-Siphon Training. They are here to disrupt the traditional training industry by providing high-quality, cutting-edge education to everyone, regardless of financial position. Use the link in the description below. You go to training, pay what you can training. The reason this week is so special is because John Strand himself, who... John Strand, who has his own emote in the squad emote tray, which I just dropped on stream. You can see it there in chat. At the later part of this week, September 18th, or excuse me, a week from today, John will be leading a four-day, four-hour-a-day, 16-hour getting started in InfoSec course using MITRE ATT&CK, and it is whatever you want to pay. Zero dollars, no big deal. $25, come on in. $500, you can sit in a cool, comfy chair. Doesn't matter. Everybody gets access to this class if you want it. John Strand is amazing when it comes to giving to the community. He personally inspires me. Simply CyberCon, the shirt I'm wearing right now, the same John Strand is the keynote speaker. So believe that. Check it out. All right, guys. We got a great show for you. Let me take a big slug of coffee. I hope everybody's doing well. 20 seconds till news. You can see it, we're 20 seconds to lift off. So there's like the steam's coming off the spaceship or the, the rocket, but like we haven't left the pad yet. So get your coffee, get comfortable. And let's let the cool sounds of the hot news Fashy. wash over us in an awesome way. Reminder, I don't prep or research any of these stories beforehand. It's cybersecurity headlines. It's Monday, September 11th. 2023. Evil Telegram fake apps send spyware. Kaspersky has discovered some malicious apps disguised as, quote, faster versions of Telegram, end quote, that are in fact spyware. These specific apps appear to have been created to spy on Chinese speaking users and a Uyghur ethnic minority. They appear to be very similar to the original Telegram app, but with additional code for info stealing. 
They are also using the org.telegram.messenger package names with the suffix .wab or .wob, while the regular messenger app uses .web. Kaspersky reported the presence of these apps to Google. Okay. Akamai. All right, so a couple things here. One, um, and this is really interesting, um, they call it a Trojanized telegram, okay? So... <laughs> There's, there's a lot to do here, okay? So one, China, really well known for their authoritative uh, government surveillance, um, you know, authoritative uh, population control, et cetera, right? That shouldn't be new. They're all up in that. Now, there is a subset of the population in China, Northwest China, called the Uyghur population. Basically, um, I might be getting this wrong, but they're, they're Muslim-based Chinese individuals, right? So it's their, their religion that is... Um, unique about them from the rest of the Chinese population. The main China po uh, government isn't a big fan of that, okay? Now, this is not a geopolitical show. This isn't a religious show. This isn't any of that. This is a cybersecurity daily news briefing show, okay? So just as a preface with that, I would encourage you, if you have a strong stomach and you want to know what is going on, do some research into what has happened with the Uyghur population. I think it's WIG. Uh, H Y U R. Look at what is happening to them over the last five to ten years. It's it's unbelievable. I mean, it's borderline genocide is what's going on up there. So, but please do your own research. Now, here's the thing. There's this established, um, you know, focus. There's an established eye of Sauron from the main Chinese government at the Uyghur population. So, how do they? root out people who might be pretending to be mainstream China, but also secretly practicing uh, Muslim or coordinating, um, you know, for revolution or anything like that, right? You've got to remember in any society, I don't care if it's China or if it's Orwellian, um, you know, like a fictitious one, in any society, when there is a group of dissent, when there is a group of non-popular opinion looking to you know, have a coup, have a revolution, have a different way of life, whatever. One of the key things that they are required to have is communication. It's how you organize. This is why labor unions are a concern to big, you know, corporate America, right? Or, you know, Fortune 500 companies. And the only way that it works is if they communicate with each other and they organize, strengthen numbers, right? Okay. Well, if communication is so critical, how do they communicate? Well, they use apps like Telegram and Signal and, and uh, WhatsApp and stuff like that. So it behooves uh, the people in power to intervene and get involved in that. Now, and instead of intercepting the communications, which they could because they control the network, that communication is encrypted. So they need to go up, 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 up the OSI stack. And if you've taken my GRC class, you know what the OSI stack is. If you've been around for a minute, you know what the OSI stack is. If it's encrypted at the network layer, you got to go up the stack until it gets decrypted. So get up into the app level. And that's what they've done here. They have created a Trojanized version of Telegram. It's essentially looks, acts, breathes, smells, everything like Telegram, except it also copies off everything that comes in and out of your Telegram account to some server controlled by them. This isn't a look-alike. This isn't a keylogger, um, you know, like fake app that you install and you're like, oh, it doesn't work, uninstall. It literally works just like Telegram. It will, you can communicate. You might not even know that you're the one running a Trojanized version, but all of your contacts, all of your communications, all of it is getting pilfered out to some data center somewhere controlled by the people who Trojanized it, right? And I guarantee you, I mean, dude, they're aces when it comes to espionage, whether it's spying on their citizens or spying on their adversaries. They are, you know, they're great at it. So TLDR here, this is another mechanism to identify and root out key members of any type of, you know, revolution or coordination or anything like that. Again, I encourage you, if you have a strong stomach, to Google and research this. It is... It is unbelievable. Announces the mitigation of the largest DDoS attack on a U.S. financial company. The financial institution in question is unnamed, but Akamai says at its peak, the traffic hit 633.7 gigabits per second, and the attack itself lasted two minutes, occurring on September 5th. 
They add the attack was, quote, proactively mitigated by our customers' comprehensive cyber defense posture, end quote. Rice. All right. Um, so there was a distributed denial of service attack on a U.S. financial company. Uh, the attack lasted less than two minutes. Okay. At approximately 1931 UTC. What time is, um, can someone do the math really quick? What time is that in uh, East Coast time? Because immediately my thoughts go to, okay, if you're going to attack a financial company for two minutes, then it's probably a business in New York. It was probably during active trading time. And it was probably, um, if I had to guess, some type of, you know. Straight cash, homie. Because other than that, like, I mean, dude, what are you like flexing for two minutes? Ugh. Like by the time you even get on the phone with somebody, the DOS attack is over, right? Now, I also want to say that Akamai said that they helped protect and and um, protect and thwart this attack. So it's quite possible. Um, it's quite possible that it could have been longer and they were able to stymie it. Um, but 600 gigs a second is no joke. I wish my I wish my AT and T fiber was 600 gigs a, gigs a second. I feel like that's what they offered me or or sold me when I was paying for it. But if you do a download test, all right. Um, I feel like okay. I feel like um, is there a graphic in here? No. I've done this before. Um. I won't do it right now. Listen, if you're interested, distributed denial of service attacks, distributed denial of service attacks are the way that modern denial of service attacks work. They are a bit crude, but they are effective. You basically can blow something that's internet facing off the internet for a period of time. However, it only lasts as long as the denial of service attack is lasting, right? And by denial of service, I, I mean a traditional blowing network traffic at it, right? If you flash the firmware and or do a, a wiper and you wipe all the systems, you're still denying them service. But that's not, we don't typically refer to that as a denial, denial of service attack. Um, if that were the case, like ransomware would be a denial of service attack, which it's not. When we say denial of service in industry, we're almost always talking about network traffic being blasted and you have to keep it going. Um, and again, it has to come from distributed sources or else you would just block an IP address and call it a day. Akamai and Cloud9 are, uh, is it Cloud9? That For some reason, that doesn't sound right. Yeah, I guess it is right. Cloud9? Why does that not sound right? So in my mind, it's Akamai and Cloud9 are like the two or bigger uh, denial of service protection services that you can pay and outsource. You can see here, if you want to get into the weeds on a technical level uh, on how they executed this, they sent a, um, where is it? I saw, I saw, well, come on now, bro. Where is it? There we go. So you can see that they sent a combination of act, push, reset, sin, flood, attack vectors. These are basically TCP flags. So if you really want to get into the weeds of the TCP protocol, there's eight flags that you can set. And the flags kind of control the, the protocol and the handshake between a client and the server. And if you start messing with it, which you can do if you uh, manually adjust the flags, the server doesn't know what to do. It really quickly, a simple explanation of a SIN flood attack, since I like to... Um, I like to share and knowledge and educate. So this is a more you know moment really quickly. A sin flood attack is pretty pretty much the easiest, um, in my opinion, denial of service attack to kind of wrap people's heads around. So when I make a, a, a connection to a, a server or web browser to a server, you type in like simplycyber.io, hit enter, and it comes up with the website. There's this three-way handshake. Everybody talks about it. It's almost like as popular as the CIA triad. Sin, sin ac, Ack, or no, no, sin, ack, sin, ack. I'm sorry, right? Sin, ack, sin, ack. And it's a three-way handshake. Well, here's the thing. If I send the sin and you send the ack, the server is now waiting for the sin, ack packet to come back to establish the full connection. And it has to hold in memory a little buffer spot that says, I got a sin from uh, BSEC. 
and I sent an act. So I'm waiting for a sin act packet from BSEC. Oh, I got a, a sin packet from Kimberly. I'm waiting for an us, and I sent an act back to Kimberly. I'm waiting for a sin act for Kimberly. Oh, I got another sin from BSEC, and I sent an act. And basically, if you flood the buffer, when Jerry or Joel sends a sin, the server says, I've got no more memory to store, like to send an act and store that I sent it to Joel Belton. So effectively denial of service, right? Now, there's tons of ways to adjust and address that particular risk. Um, there's like twack, twack sticking. <laughs> there's stack tweaking. There's how long do you hold it in the buffer, right? There's a million things. But anyways, that's a simple example of how denial of service can happen at a technical level with a sin flood. The more you know, right? Okay. Oh. Zachary, Zachary's in the house with the suck plus. Come on, Zachary, what's up? I came in like a nice. Attacks three more hospitals. Back on August 25th, we reported on the Singing River Health System, which runs three major hospitals and dozens of clinics along the Gulf Coast near New Orleans, which suffered an event that took them. Hold on, really quickly. So BSEC did the math on that last story on when it hit. Um. And this hit at 8.18 a.m. on the East Coast. I feel like markets open at 9 a.m., but uh, business starts at 8 a.m., so maybe their goal was to, like, scare the crap out of everybody first thing in the morning and have it persist throughout the day. I don't know. Flying. It now appears that this was the work of the Rysida ransomware gang. That's R-H-Y-S-I-D-A, the same group that attacked Prospect... Yeah, BSEC saying most next-gen firewalls can stop those simple attacks. Exactly. That sin flood attack, that's like, you know, hey, hold on. Ring, ring, ring. Hello? Oh, hey, 2001 is on the phone. They want their sin flood attack, right? Like, you know, low orbit ion cannon type stuff. So um, thank you, BSEC. He's 100% right. Next-gen firewalls for the win. Medical holdings in August affecting hospitals in California, Texas, Connecticut, Rhode Island, <coughs> and Pennsylvania. The attribution to Ricida is being made by cybersecurity researcher Dominic Alvieri, who posted a tweet about it yesterday morning. That's Sunday. Notepad plus... All right, hold on. What the hell? This graphic you sent me, BSEC, says 8 a.m. Bruh. All right, hold on. So now I'm... Be hold on. L literally, I can touch my earpiece. Huh? This is just coming in across the wire. Do -do 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 Breaking news. Apparently, it's 3 p.m. Eastern time somehow. So whatever. End of the business day, I guess. Seems a little less impactful, honestly. Plus 8.5.7 oh. released. Hold on. I got to talk about this story. I'm getting all wrapped around the axle uh, here. So re reside a ransomware group. Guys, you know, it's a day that ends in Y. There's some more. Um... Oh, my God. Uh, BSEC, I can't. I don't know what. I don't remember what time the attack happened to UTC anymore. Okay, so. This guy is talking about uh, Re Recita ransomware. I haven't heard of them before. They're obviously on the move. Um, they are attacking hospitals, which is deplorable. Um, you can see the impact is real. Guys, literally, literally, literally. Um, well, two things. One, this is awful. If you work in healthcare, you should absolutely uh, be mindful of this. There's multiple tiers of impact here between HIPAA violations, between... Uh, you know, obviously, uh, um, business operation downtime, the ability to not meet uh, patients with medical needs in the uh, emergency room, having to have staff work on downtime procedures, i.e. paper and pen. Also, and this one gets overlooked quite often, let's say that you have AIDS. Let's say that you're 16-year-old female and you're pregnant. Let's say that you have an addiction to opioids or whatever, right? Let's let's pick some of these fringe, uh, not I mean not fringe is maybe not the right word, but some of these less socially acceptable um, circumstances, okay? And now you have it, and now it's public for everybody to know, right? That like, dude, there's been no like, there's actual documented examples of people who will not go to the hospital because they don't want their privacy violated in their situation made public or they'll drive 50 miles to go to an emergency room so they're not getting uh patient care in their community okay so this has this can have real deep impact on individuals okay so tldr you definitely want to practice i say this all the time with ransomware get good protection procedures in place minimize the amount of data that's everywhere 
Um, that way it's less likely to get breached and make sure your tabletop exercisers are being executed to recover properly. This affected 16 hospitals and 166 clinics. That's gross. Um, also want to point out, um, and I've said this before too, in the United States, the healthcare system is, it's like, it looks like the metal. If you guys have seen Terminator 2, when the, they freeze the metal guy and then he explodes at the foundry and the foundry starts heating up and then the little mercury pool starts like, bloop, like it like attracts to each other and the pools get bigger and bigger until he forms back into the T-1000 and he's just like, oh, I'm a Terminator, right? That's what the U.S. healthcare system is doing. There's all sorts of like, you know, there used to be like one physician practices. I got my little leather bag. I come to your house. And then it was like, oh, here's three physicians and like 25 nurses. And it's like, you know, whatever, um, you know, uh, Anchorage local dermatology. And it was like, that's the practice, right? There's this consolidation to healthcare systems. And now things like Prospect Holdings, Community Health System, MUSC, like they're Prisma Health. Like they're just coagulating and you're either getting acquired or you're acquiring, and like I said, in five, 10 years, there's probably gonna be like three systems and they're, they're gonna stop acquiring each other or else the US government's gonna get involved and say that it's a monopoly and antitrust and break it up, okay? All right. Also worth noting, okay, and this is a private thing. This Friday, I won't be here to do the show. Eric Taylor will be doing the show. Why? Because I have to go to, I have to fly to a client site and I'm giving a talk to some senior level risk people who work in healthcare. I told my POC who I've been working with on developing this talk, I said, don't worry. I guarantee you there will be some major news story that drops the week of the talk in healthcare around ransomware. I hate that it's so easy to predict, but like, here you go. If, you, if you're going to be in my talk Friday at 10 a.m., I'll be talking about Recita ransomware. Jesus, it's not good. The fixes. The popular and free source code editor is now at version 8.5.7, fixing multiple buffer overflow zero days and answering recent proof of concept exploits. The most severe of its vulnerabilities received is... Raul Balon. What's up, hashtag team live. Good to see you. Good to see you. CVE number 2023-40031 with a rating of 7.8, although some users question how possible it would be to perform code execution with this flaw. Okay. All right, so I guess this is a news story because Notepad++ is fun. Uh, I don't know if you're a Notepad++. Let's run a poll. Let's run a poll really quickly. Do you regularly use Notepad++? I'm kind of curious. I do not. I don't even think about it, frankly. I know it's popular. If I do use a text editor, I use Sublime. But for the most part, I take my notes in Notion. When I need something, I just open regular Notepad. Go ahead and take a vote really quickly. Um, apparently, there has been multiple buffer overflow zero days. Um, and one could potentially lead to co-ed execution. That's a, that's a, a brittle, that's a brittle declaration potential. Okay. Um, way to go, uh, for this, uh, researcher who released it and got CVEs on their name, by the way, um, really quick, since this is like, whatever, if you're running notepad plus plus, go ahead and patch it. You could share with uh, your community. This just seems not a high risk. Uh, not something that you'd want to ignore, but not really a high risk. Um, the other thing I want to point out, and I'm not saying what this security researcher did is in any way the same thing. I'm just pointing it out because it feels like a good opportunity. If you go check out um, Joel Hell, um, CVE talk. Let me see if I can. Joel Hell is, um, he works over at TCM as a pet. He leads the pen testing uh, work over at um, TCM, Acad well, TCM is more than Academy. There's also, but um, if you check this out, this is a talk from August 3rd, 2021. He gave this talk also at Wild West Hacking Fest last year, which I attended. And I just, I'll tell you why I'm sharing this in a second. Joe, in this talk, in this blog post, which there's a talk to, right? So you could find that. 
what he outlines here is how easy it is to go find CVEs. And he lays out a um, workflow on how to do it. Okay, now this is a member only story, so maybe you can't do it, but this is a good starting point for you to find what you need. Anyways, he there is a really well-defined workflow that Joe gives you that you can have CVEs. Now, why would you care, right? Is there some value in this? Well, here's the deal, guys. If you have CVEs on your resume, that is a game changer. That gets people's heads turning. I'm telling you right now, if you had five certifications or you had like two CVEs, the CVEs are way more rare. They're way more exotic. They're way more interesting to talk about. They're way more like you can explain how you found them, what they were, how you disclosed them. It puts you on a level that makes you really interesting, okay? Now, I'm not saying it's trivial to go find CVEs, but what I am saying is, uh, and the, the TLDR here is that a CVE in some GitHub repo and a CVE in Microsoft Word, those are obviously two different types of CVEs and probably level of difficulty. But much like when you say you have a bachelor's degree, most people aren't like, well, what college is it from? I'm going to be judging you on what college it's from. Most times they say, oh, you have a bachelor's degree. They might not even ask you what's it in, but like, oh, you got a bachelor's in computer science. Come on in. This is great, right? People aren't going to say, oh, well, wait a minute. What software did you get a CVE in, right? So there's easier low-hanging fruit softwares to get CVEs. Joe outlines how to do this. And I'm telling you, it's very powerful for your resume. All right. And it's resume. I know. I was joking around. Okay. Let's keep going. And now a word from our sponsor, Conveyor. What's scarier than the Sunday scaries? Opening your inbox to a 200 question, 15 tab macro enabled workbook containing a customer security questionnaire to complete. Puke. Let Conveyor's AI security questionnaire automation tool powered by OpenAI help your answering process go a lot faster. Spend 91% less time on questionnaires when you get precise answers auto-generated for you. Try a free proof of concept to see how fast you can get through questionnaires with Conveyor at www.conveyor.com. That's C-O-N-V-E-Y-O-R.com. All right, really quickly ending the poll here. Looks like, uh, you know, 60% do not, uh, do not use it. Um, only half the community voted on this, but that's okay. Um, kind of split down the middle, I'd say. I mean, obviously leaning towards no, but it's still a pretty representative population who are using it. So very interesting. All right, guys. I don't know if we have any first timers here. I didn't see any, but that's okay. Our long timers, we're all up in this piece. You guys know exactly what we do at the mid roll. By the way, are we at 30 minutes? 31. Guys, we nail it pretty consistently, right? All right, guys. I want to thank you all for being here. Thank you all so very much. I want to thank the stream sponsors again, Barricade Cyber, Panopsi, Anti-Siphon Training. And guys, I want to thank all of you. If you have a hot minute, do me a favor, hit that like button. Will Reed. What's up, Will Reed? I feel like it's been a minute. Good to see you in chat. Guys, do me a favor, hit the like button. Why? It goes a long way to paying it forward. Oh, yeah. It goes a long way to paying it forward. It's how other people can find it. It's how we get our first timers. It's how you may have found it. Simple Man Guitar first timer. What's up, Simple Man Guitar? Good to have you in chat. So nice to see you. Smash that like button and pay it forward. Help someone else find what's going on. Guys, I want to tell you about the Simply Cyber Community Challenge. Faraz Azari is currently the baton holder. Faraz, please do me a favor and tag somebody in chat. Give them the baton. For the rest of the Simply Cyber community, do yourself a favor. If you would like to supercharge your LinkedIn feed for free and build a meaningful, valuable professional network, do the following. Go on to LinkedIn, search for this hashtag. Once you find it, you'll see a bunch of posts. Connect with the people, first level connection with people who are writing the posts. Also connect with the people who are in the comments. This is gonna take you some time. It's gonna take you, right now, if you were to start for the first time, it might take you an hour. Believe me, one hour invested today is going to pay massive dividends in the future. Also comment on the post. You will get picked up in the Peloton. Go to Faray's post, comment on it. Those who get the, um, the baton, 
Post your cyber story. Hey, K. K Scott Powell, I'll, I'll answer this in one second. Uh, go get your, um, the, share your cyber story, right? And connect to those people. Anyways, long story short, in two weeks' time, you're going to have a banger of a LinkedIn network. Your LinkedIn feed is going to be hacked and essentially supercharged with supportive, inclusive, useful cybersecurity content. Thank you all so very much. Now, I want to say what's up for uh, K. Scott Powell. Just become best friends. Yep. K. Scott Powell is looking for a, uh, hey, Simply Cyber Community, I'm looking for a new role as our landlords are selling our house and my wife is expecting our third child. The stress is mounting, so I'm exploring all options. Thanks. All right, Simply Cyber Community, K. Scott Powell, let us know if it's remote or local or uh, in person, where, where you are. I know where you are, but... Um, and what type of work are you looking for? SecOps, GRC, engineering, architecture? Are, are you open to moving? Let us know. All right, guys. Hey, every single day, and by the way, uh, my heart goes out to you, K. Scott Powell. That's that's a really sucky situation to have to deal with, man. Um, all right, hey, it's it's Callan's Art of the Week. Every single day we do something special, and today is Callan's Art of the Week. We got a banger for you today. This is Callan. He spent a lot of time this weekend working on this. There is an awful lot going on on here. Okay, I'm just gonna give you the quick ones. This is a volcano. Where, this is a volcano. This is, I think this is our family. This is the Teen Titans Go headquarter. This is, all, hold on. This is all the Teen Titans Go cyborg. If you watch Teen Titans Go, you know what's up. That show's awesome. Uh, hold on one second. It's so hard to see, okay? Um, I forget what this is over here, honestly. There's an underground lair that Callan has built down here somewhere that people live. Um, and then this is the Among Us guys dropping bombs uh, out of helicopters, if you're familiar with Among Us. So anyways, there is an awful lot going on here. Callan, Callan basically, he usually drips his creativity out. He just like took a, a wrench and like broke the top off the spigot and was spewing creativity on this one. So way to go, Callan. Very much appreciate it. Dad loves you. All right, guys, let's keep on, keep on, keeping on. More needs to be done for mental health and cybersecurity, say studies. The stresses and work demands of cybersecurity are taking a severe toll on the people in charge of preventing and resolving problems, and this is leading to serious mental health issues, including burnout, substance abuse, and even suicide. This is according to a group of cybersecurity workers speaking to CyberScoop this past week with the goal of raising awareness and implementing better protections. The story quotes a study from Tynes, T-I-N-E-S, that showed that, quote, 66% of respondents had significant levels of stress at work, end quote, and also a study from Gartner that predicted that nearly half of cybersecurity leaders will change jobs by 2025, and 25% of these for different roles entirely due to work-related stress. Yeah. And I'm not going to Jen Easterly um, emo, but even they even quote Jen Easterly here. Uh, if you've seen Jen's uh, social media posts, her brother, they lost her brother to suicide. Um, suicide, obviously, the most extreme uh, impacts of mental health or one of the more extremes mental health impacts. Um, really quickly, like TCM, I believe TCM just did a live stream. Um like last week or it's this week. Um, September 6th, right? On mental health. It's okay to take a break. You can see there's Heath, Zach, and Don, Donzel. All right, it's okay to take a break. This is a real thing, guys, okay? This is a real serious thing, okay? So a couple things to point out. Um. I am super inclusive, okay? That is a um, tenant of Simply Cyber. It's a value. But I wouldn't. I would be remiss if I if I lied and said, oh, like you know, cybersecurity is for everyone. Cybersecurity is not a problem. Like the reality is, yes, any like it's welcome to everybody who wants to. But you got to understand part of, and this is why I say it's a lifestyle. Like people are like, well, what are you talking about lifestyle? Like I like work, but I like life better. Here's the deal. It's everything's constantly changing. Threat actors don't work nine to five. Threat actors don't take holidays off. In fact, they actually 
attack on holidays because they know that most people are either got a skeleton crew working, uh, the junior staff, because, you know, who doesn't, who wants to work on Christmas day, um, et cetera. SOC analysts they're, or incident responders are actively dealing with a compromise. You can't, you can't punch out or it's very difficult to punch out and be like, well, Hey, you know what? It's five o'clock. I know that you're actively under attack and like you're down and patient care is suffering or you can't make financial transactions or, you know, like you can't pay your taxes, which might not seem like a big deal or, Oh, how's this one? Municipality goes down and you're about to purchase a home that you're moving into, but because the municipality's down, you can't actually hold the transaction meeting with the lawyers because they can't process it. So you can't move into your house. So now you're like homeless, even though you have money to buy a house, right? There's all these things. George Strasberger, 911, you're not alone. Exactly. There was, I'm not going to name names, but there was a really well known content creator um, that had some, there was like a big thing that happened at the end of last week, um, you know, around mental health and concern. I myself have been working with um, some charities that have to do with um, mental health. So anyways, this is a real thing, okay? And it's one that if you go into the industry eyes wide open, then at least you have a chance of managing it. And I would say that it's incumbent upon leadership to be mindful of managing health, mental health and, and physical health, frankly, of staff, right? So this is a real thing in our industry. We've come a long way. Guys, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, like mental health had a wicked negative stigma. Like if you spoke up that you were having mental health issues, people would look at you like you were unstable and a risk and not to work here anymore, right? So we've come a long way in socially accepting and having open conversations about mental health. But talking about it, and continuing to just hammer the person with the challenges and the stress and everything that's causing the mental health issues, that's the real deal. So um, whenever we talk with SOC analysts, um, exactly, 100% on leadership uh, to see the burnout. Unfortunately, the thing is, it's like sometimes leadership treats humans like they're cogs, right? Like, oh, like it's not a problem. Like b -Sec's really good. Just throw b -Sec at it. Oh, b -Sec. Hey, oh, exchange on-prem got breached, send it to BSEC, right? Without without little thought that like BSEC has kids, BSEC's doing football, BSEC's on travel, BSEC's also managing all the network stuff, right? You can't like, these are people, <laughs> right? So anyways, let's go a long way. Definitely, um, if you see something, say something, offer to help someone. You know, if you are um, burning out yourself, uh, say something, I, I honestly, you know, again, I'm not a mental health expert in, by any stretch of the means. But for me personally, I've always found if you keep it to yourself, it, it's, it, it festers a lot more and a lot worse. If you say something, at least you've poked a hole and there's some relief coming, you know, just to know that someone else knows what you're dealing with. You know, and this is why, you know, having a, having a, a best friend, having a confidant, having a spouse, having somebody you know what I mean? Anyone to, to share, even in the community, right? So be mindful of burnout. It's a real thing. Take steps. There's a lot of resources out there to help you. Um, don't suffer. Don't suffer in silence. North Korean campaign targeting security researchers. As an additional layer of stress for security researchers, Google's Threat Analysis Group has announced that North Korea is using a new campaign with at least one actively exploited zero-day being used to target security researchers in the past several weeks. According to their report, quote, the vulnerability has been reported to the affected vendor and is in the process of being patched, end quote. This campaign is similar to others that the North Korean group has used, basically befriending security researchers through social media platforms like X, formerly Twitter, before sending them a malicious zero-day file. Associated Press. Wow. Okay. Couple things here. One, um, I like I, this is probably not going to be a good, um, a good entrance here. Uh. I don't know if I'm going to be able to find something here. Um, hold on one second. I, like, I feel like this is what's coming to my mind. I just bear with me. I feel like this is what's coming to my mind. 
Um, can we, like, I need, like, I, ah, uh, damn it. I'm not even a big, I'm not even a big, um, a big wrestling person. I, bear with me. Believe me, this is going to be worth it. <laughs> this, I've got a metaphor here. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Is this, can we do this? Can we do this? No. All right. Oh, come on. I need, I need like, ah, uh, brah, forget it. I really had a big thing there. So really quickly, I, what I want is like in, in, in wrestling a million years ago when I used to watch it, like sometimes they like Royal Rumble, they bring in a person every minute. And then like, sometimes someone would be all geeked up to the part where they're like frothing, like a rabid dog. And they would just like ultimate warrior typically would just sprint like wide open and then like jump slide into the ring and then like immediately start suplexing and dropping like elbows and stuff. And it was always like super hype. Okay. Why, why am I sharing this with you? Is this one right here? Uh, B sec. Yes. Okay. Like this is good enough. Okay. So for forever, uh, North Korea, yeah, they got some espionage stuff, but Lazarus Group has been the mainstream financial um, thieves. And like, by the way, they do a great job doing it. Very sophisticated, very zero day. But it's always like, it's always like money related. And they've done some recent scams where they're trying to like, you know, hire people or trick or get hired or trick people into hiring. And it's been pretty crude. And if you've listened to the Darknet Diaries episodes, you know that it's like, you know, it's like doing a job interview over Zoom, but like not turning your camera on, taking two to three minutes to respond to an interviewer's question, these type of things. Okay, so they haven't been super good, except for Lazarus Group. And again, they've been super focused on money. This is like, hold on. And then here, I'm going to just bring this up really quickly. I feel like there's a new, there's a new like North Korean hacker in town, right? And like, they just, they just entered the ring. That's what, that, this is the whole like just to bring it full circle like in my mind north korea has like drafted a new talent or has like a like some high schooler group has graduated and been given the keyboard and now they're just like like coming in and suplexing this is there's multiple instances right now of north korean hackers doing more sophisticated more long-term more elegant attacks this one particularly they engaged with the security researcher for months social engineering, building trust, and then dropped malware on them. You don't typically do that if you're like a smash and grab or a crude attacker, right? So I'm just, I'm just saying like, in my opinion, okay, hold on, this, this gets a tinfoil hat. This gets a tinfoil hat really quickly. In my opinion, I'll be interesting to follow this. I'm sure the FBI is working on this with attribution. I mean, they know it's North Korea, but like who the actual physical human is sitting at the keyboard. If I had to guess, North Korea has a new team. They're probably young. I mean, they're acting older, but they're probably young because they would have used them already. So my, in my mind, they just came in, either graduated or whatever. They just came into uh, operational capability for North Korea. And they are killing it, right? I'm not excited about this. I'm not like, ooh, threat actors. Like, let's, let's, you know, you know, pants off. Like, new North Korean threat actors. Like, let's party. But what I am saying is, this is clearly a evolution of their TTPs. And again, Lazarus is super sophisticated, but like, this feels different. This feels like a fork, right? So we'll see. We'll see. If, if it ever comes out, I'm going to lose my mind about it. Oh, yeah, this is what I'm talking about. This is the new threat actor out of North Korea right here. Thank you, whoever brought this in. Yes. North Korea sends a new man into the ring. <laughs> All right. By the way, Simply Cyber Community, I don't go off on a tangent very often, but I'll, thank you for granting me the grace of doing this Royal Rumble <laughs> entry uh, metaphor for the North Korean hackers. As warns AP Stylebook data breach led to phishing attack. <laughs> Sometime between July 16th and July 22nd, hackers accessed an old and out-of-use AP stylebook hosted on a third-party managed site and stole the PII of 224 customers. This included, for some of these customers at least, social security number and employer ID numbers. Phishing emails started to arrive shortly afterwards, which raised the alarm. 
As Bleeping Computer points out, quote, while this was not a significant data breach with only 224 customers impacted, the login credentials for journalists and media companies are highly sought after by cyber criminals for extortion, ransomware attacks, data theft, and cyber espionage. End quote. What's up, J Jacob Daigle? Uh, first time live. Congratulations on uh, starting college. Way to go. Way to go. All right. So here's the deal. AP Stylebook, AP Associated Press. I've never fully understand it, but in my mind, the AP is like a loose alliance of freelance journalists who document stuff and then it gets picked up and sent out. Um, <clears throat> I might be a little wrong on this one, but I feel like that's what's up. Okay. So AP gets hacked. Leads to phishing. Phishing leads to compromised creds. Compromised creds lead to threat actors logging in as you or getting access to your stuff. Uh, fun fact, if they do break into your email account, which you should have had multi-factor authentication on, obviously, if they do break into your email, one of the first things that they're going to do is um, you can configure in most email clients forward to. Okay, so what does that mean? That means you can configure any email that comes into your inbox you forward it to another email address. So if you change your password, the threat actors are still getting your inbound emails. So <clears throat> if you do get compromised or you're just curious to do a sanity check, definitely confirm that your forward to account or your forward to value is either not configured, which is by default, or it's configured with something that you approve of and not something that uh, some threat actor doesn't approve of. <clears throat> okay, with this particular one, the risk is high, the impact is high. Uh, why? Because journalists usually report on things publicly, right? We talked about the Uyghur population in the first story. Journalists reporting on that. I'm sure there's uh, people in power that do not want that being reported out. Say you're a, um, you know, a, I don't know, like investigative journalism, right? They're usually uncovering corruption or bad behavior or crime or whatever, right? So if I can get in there... I can find out who you're talking to. I can start extorting you, threatening you, racketeering, offering protection, um, saying I'll attack your family, saying I know where you live, say like sending them pictures that was stored. Like say you use Google Mail and now it's like linked. You get the Google accounts. Now you can get in their Google Drive. Um, you could actually further uh, move laterally out of there, right? A lot of people think they're clever. <laughs> Really quick, a lot of people think they're clever when they get the uh, one-time password backup thing where it's like, oh, hey, if you ever get locked out of your account, you can use this combination of 15 words like onion, scooter, rascal, baseball, toddler, moon, right? Like, oh, if you use these 15 words, you'll log in automatically to your last pass or to your vault. No problem. Almost everybody goes like this picture and then the picture gets saved to your iCloud or to your Google Drive or your OneDrive or your box or whatever. Guess what threat actors do? Log in, go to your cloud storage, filter by image and then scrub. Do you know how easy it is to scrub and just look for a screenshot for that? Super easy. Threat actors and red teamers do that all the time. So that was, ooh, that was like a double two shot. That was a double espresso. That was a BOGO. We're talking about the risk of being attacked here in investigative journalism, journalists being targeted, the impact of them. But also, fun fact, you can tell Carl, Carl, if you're taking those pictures, you are introducing the risk that those accounts will get compromised too. Woo, it's a double shot. Fancy. And now, last week in ransomware. According to Bleeping Computer, last week's highlights were the Department of Justice announcing indictments on members of the TrickBot and Conti operations. These individuals were alleged... Really quick, what's up, Kathy Chambers? Have a great day, have a great week. ...involved in overall management of the cybercrime operation and developing and encrypting malware. In addition, last week, Cisco confirmed a zero-day exploit on Cisco VPN appliances after reports on its use by the Akira ransomware group. And Ragnar Locker took responsibility for an attack on an Israeli hospital claiming to have stolen one terabyte of data. Remember, if you're looking... Jesus. I'll tell you what. I mean, I wouldn't attack the United States either, but I sure as crap wouldn't attack Israel. Woo! You want to talk about kicking a hornet's nest? Okay. So it's Monday, um, there, you know, this is just a roundup of um, ransomware stories. Again, 
This is a cornucopia. Go ahead, reach in here, grab the fruit that, of your choice, whether it's a banana, a pineapple, a orange, whatever. Grab up the fruit of your choice. And by fruit, I mean like whichever ransomware story best serves you and your needs, whether you work in a hospital, whether you work in international, whether you need to educate end users or leadership. There's something here for everybody. Go ahead and pick it up. DOJ announcing indictments on TrickBot and Conti operation members. That's pretty tight. I do like that. Hold on. Give me a second. Let's follow up on that. Do we get do we get faces? Uh Federal Grand Jury in Ohio indicted Maxim Galatchin, Maxim Rudensky, Mikhail Mikhailovich. A lot of them here, guys. All Russian nationals. All Rus Russian nationals, okay? This is interesting. This is the TrickBot gang, okay? Dude, by the way, Emotet, TrickBot, and... Um, oh, my God. Uh, Ryuk Ransomware were, like, the, the, the triple banger, right? I know that we don't... This I guess this is a wrestling uh, episode. You don't typically see a three-person tag team. It's usually two people for tag teams, but occasionally they'll have the three-person tag team. Um, this like Emotet, TrickBot and Ryuk was a three person tag team there, like really causing havoc from like 15 to 16 ish, 17 ish. Um, Emotet went down and then it came back up. All right. They're also saying for the Conti ransomware, I'm actually kind of digging into this really quickly. Middle district of Tennessee indictments for Golochkin, Rudensky, Savarev, Zukov. Okay. So this is really, really interesting, okay? So check this out. Check this out, okay? Get your tinfoil hat here. Oh, yeah. Regulators! Mauna. It was a okay, I have a wicked hot take, okay? Percy! I have a super hot take. This is borderline jawjacking, okay? Again, this is not a political show, but check this out. I find this incredibly interesting. If you look at the indictment, Okay, these are the people who are indicted. The key thing here, they're all Russian nationals. They go on to indict more of these same people for Conti ransomware, and then they get this guy, Golochkin, for a Conti ransomware on Scripps Health. But all of the indictments, and exclusively all of the indictments, are on these like eight or nine gentlemen of Russian national descent. Y'all, Conti ransomware gang wizard spider as it's known in the fire eye community was half ukrainian half russian all of the indictments are for russian nationals none of them are for ukrainian nationals it just seems seems odd right i mean i'm not drawing conclusions here but doesn't it seem odd that they got all the russian ones and none of the ukrainian ones i find it i find it interesting it just you know, draw your own conclusions. Here we go. We got we got the uh, the shots here. This guy right here. This is what we're looking at here. Um, this is not exclusively all of the ones. There's other ones here that we're not seeing. Uh, but this is the cybers most wanted on the FBI website. So very interesting here. By the way, this guy right here, Igor. This guy right here is Lazarus Group on the right. I recognize he's Lazarus as well. Yeah, so this is really interesting. Here's Mikel. He used Conti ransomware. So, anyways, yeah, you can you can definitely get up in it. But way to go, way to go, uh, way to go, law enforcement. Again, I'm not I'm not speculating what it all means. I just find it really interesting. Like it's one of those deep seated little notes that you may not catch if you read it, but to me it jumped out immediately. I'm like, what the hell? Like, that's why Conti ransomware imploded. That's why Wizard Spider disbanded. It was because Russia invaded Ukraine and Wizard Spider officially, one of these guys right here, literally officially declared for the entire Wizard Spider gang that they were pro-Russia. Go Russia. Viva la Russia. And the Ukrainian people in the gang were like, bro, what? And then they released all of the Conti papers. Go look at Brian Krebs Conti papers um, right up. And then the, the Conti just imploded, and that was the end of it, right? So I just I just find it interesting. All right, really quickly, that's going to do it for the news today. Hi, I'm on time, 8.58. Before you leave, 
Um, I do want to remind everybody, later today at 4 p.m. Eastern Time, I'm getting into the haikus, y'all. I'll be teaching you SQL injection using SQL Map. SQL Map is a very popular tool. Uh, it's been incorporated into the world of haiku uh, learning video game platform. And I'll be showing you SQL injection. We'll straight up attack a website. We'll take it over. We'll dump creds. We'll high five everybody. And we're going to go for it. So definitely don't sleep on that. I'll drop a link in chat. I got a couple more things to share with you. All right. If you were here just for the news, I want to thank all of you very, very much. Uh, and we're going to transition over to uh, jaw jacking if you guys are into that. I'm Jerry. This is Simply Cyber's Daily Cyber Threat Brief, episode 448 on September 11, 2023. If you got to go, y'all, go crush your week. We'll see you back here tomorrow at 8 a.m. Eastern Time. Some of you I'll see at 4 p.m. Thanks to the mods. Thanks to all of you. Until next time, stay secure. All right, let me get chat up as I am prone to do. There we go. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the after party for the Simply Cyber Daily Cyber Threat Brief. If you're like, what is the after party? This is what we do here. We straight up kick it retro synthwave style. You know, this is what I like. So uh, <laughs> so I, I push it. We do some jaw jack and I'll hang out for about 30 minutes. I'll ask as, I'll answer as many questions as I possibly can. I do have a, um, a request. This is completely optional. You absolutely do not have to do anything with what I'm about to tell you, okay? This is like a little bit of a, uh, I guess like a fundraiser type thing if you want to call it that. So check this out really quickly. I'm going to pin a chat comment. Give me a second here. I guess this is how I sponsor jaw jacking. So check this out. Um, this is a link to this report. Okay, visualize Quackbot. All right. We'll put hashtag ad. Here's the deal. If you hold on, stop. I got to pin this thing. Here's the deal. I got a pin comment right now. If you click on the link, it's going to take you to this story. This is a uh, blog post from a team Simru visualizing Quackbot. If you're familiar with Operation Duck Hunt the other day and the coordinated uh, law enforcement takedown of it. This is a really interesting blog post about the backend infrastructure of Quackbot. This is a sponsored post. So if you click on the link, if you click on the link in the pin chat, Simply Cyber will receive a, f uh, well, it's possible we'll receive a fee. You guys crush it every single time I do this. I genuinely appreciate it. Um, I might actually stop using this platform simply because you got last time uh, I did this like a couple of weeks ago, they said that only four people clicked and I was like, that's not possible. And they're like, nope, that's only four people. So I, I'm, I'm not sure what all's going on, but I saw this blog post. I thought it was really interesting. If you'd like to get into the technical details of the infrastructure used to maintain this initial uh, infection, um, you know, I guess campaign. It's very cool. So check it out. Thank you for sponsoring the show. All right. Looking at chat here. Is it easy to get into cyber for law enforcement? Jonathan Reed. Jonathan Reed. Couple, couple things. One, Jesse Johnson is in chat. He's former law enforcement. Two, law enforcement. Yes. There, it, I don't want to say it's easy. It's not easy for anyone to get into cybersecurity. Um, IT people might have it a little easier, but law enforcement, there's something called digital forensics, which aligns exactly with um, law enforcement. And then there's an, thanks everybody uh, for, for clicking and, and checking it out. Uh, here's the deal. The, um, there's a cyber threat intelligence is another, you know, role in cybersecurity and law enforcement. If you've been uh, gr not groomed, but like, uh, developed to be able to do investigations and understand how to follow uh, evidence and like have hunches and stuff like that. 
Cyber threat intelligence analyst is another excellent role that lends itself to law enforcement. So Jonathan Reed, I would recommend you check out that if you're interested. And also, um, oh my God, what is the, um, oh my God. Guys, what's the um, InfraGuard? You can check out InfraGuard, which is like the FBI's, uh, it, state by state has its own InfraGuard. So it's like loosely affiliated nationally, but I-N-F-R-A, G-A-R-D, InfraGuard, can help you. Woo, look at that, Super Chat, Sherry. How you doing, Sherry? Thanks for the Super Chat. Let me let me do this really quickly. Sherry with the Super Chat. Can we just become best friends? Yep. I, I love Sherry. Sherry came to the Simply Cyber community maybe two months ago, three months ago, because she wanted to learn more about cybersecurity to talk with her grandkids about it and instantly became like a full-time member and showing up every episode and high five. And so thanks, Sherry. It's great to have you. I hope you had a wonderful weekend. Uh, Curtis Durton, Curtis Durton uh, accepting the baton. So Curtis, definitely looking forward to your post on LinkedIn for the Simply Cyber Community Challenge. All right, here we go. Are you, as you are a GRC specialist, thank you, Isaac. How do you tell which framework to use for small or medium-sized business? NIST, ISO, CSF, or COBIT? Okay, here's the here's the quick and dirty answer, okay? Isaac, if you are, ready? I'm going to break this down for you, wicked simple. If you're a small business, right? CIS 18 is the right way to go, right? It, so... Small businesses typically will have like no information security, okay? If you're going to adopt something, CIS 18 is the best one because it's easy. CIS 18 is basically training wheels for security frameworks. Very easy to understand, very easy to communicate, very easy to measure, okay? CIS 18. Then if you want to bump it up a little bit, right? You're like, oh, those are rookie numbers. I, I, I'm building a real program here. I'm getting my swole on. NIST cybersecurity framework is where I would go. I think NIST cybersecurity framework scales really well for different size businesses, for different industries. They even have profiles uh, developed out there. It's well supported. It's well informed. It's voluntary based. CSF is where you want to go. Now, if you work in Europe, you would you may want to use ISO. I don't know why Europeans love themselves some ISO. I've never really dug into ISO, but you can use ISO. ISO is more complicated. COBIT is not a great framework, okay? COBIT is for um, publicly traded companies to demonstrate Sarbanes-Oxley compliance that they have controls in place to prevent um, like uh, collusion and corruption. It stemmed from Enron. And with COBIT, you're looking more at permissions like, oh, do I have the ability in the ERP app to like create a new vendor, then issue a PO and then have the PO paid. Like that's a massive separation of duty issues. COVID is not a framework that you should look at for implementing a well-rounded cybersecurity program. Uh, you also didn't mention SOC 2, but I'll, I'll mention it for you. SOC 2 is okay. It's not really a great framework. People use it as a framework. You can with SOC 2, where you'd want to focus on SOC 2 and get get going on it is if you are a tech startup usually but if you're any company that is looking to get contracts or more importantly looking to get acquired Great cash, homie. right and there's businesses like that's the business plan oh we're going to scale up and then sell we're going to scale up and then get acquired right that's all it is SOC 2 is kind of like a uh, I don't want to call it a Rosetta Stone, but a lot of businesses will use a SOC 2 compliance certification as evidence that your business is like, okay, at security. If you don't have it, they might be like, yeah, I don't really feel like acquiring you or investing our dollars in you because you're not serious, right? That's what's up with different frameworks. Uh, Justin, email to interview for a GRC role. Nice, Justin. Nice, nice, straight crush it, homie. Lots of videos on the channel on how to crush interviews. Um, there's a whole, um, there's a whole section in the GRC analyst masterclass around that. Definitely take advantage of all that. <clears throat> need, need water. Your up one glass. Okay. Um, 
is it worth getting in the cybersecurity with little to no experience? I feel like it's hard. All right, so Gustav. Um, Gustav asks, is it worth getting into cybersecurity with little to no experience? Yes, absolutely. Okay, tons of people are starting every day. Okay, here's the thing I would tell you, Gustav, and I would tell everybody else. He says, I feel like it's hard, but interesting. You're right on both of those, okay? Here is the deal. I say this a lot. I, and by the way, I'm like the number one cheerleader for like, get in cyber. I love cyber. I talk about cyber. I sleep. In, I, I like dream about cyber. I work cyber. I share. I educate. I love cybersecurity. I love it. I, here. Cybersecurity. I love it. I love it. I love it. Listen, I love it. Okay? But it's not for everybody. Okay? And I'm not gatekeeping. I'm not being exclusive. Here's the deal. You say it's hard but interesting. It's incredibly interesting. I've been working in this field 20 years, and there's a ton of stuff I don't know. I regularly demonstrate it on stream at 4 o'clock on Mondays when I'm, like, bumbling about trying to hack into a web app. And wonderful people like Jenny Housley and Leonardo and Bjorn come into chat and, and help me, right? So you can work forever and not know most of what's going on in the industry, okay? That shouldn't scare you. You shouldn't have imposter syndrome. What you should hear when I say that is, holy crap, there's an opportunity to always learn and always be interesting and always be intrigued and always keep developing, right? So you have to be a lifelong learner. You also have to stay current, like doing the threat briefing every day, right? You've got to maintain, you got you to gotta keep the engine going, right? So it's a lot of work. There is no easy button, okay? But if you want to get on that train, then yeah, you can absolutely do it. And the on-ramp is hard, especially with no IT background. You're going to have to get that experience. You're going to have to get that knowledge. In my classes, I have primers that can give you networking software, cloud, um, operating system background. But make no mistake, Gustav and everyone else, it's not easy. But if you commit, if you put in the work, here's the deal. At the end of the day, you just got to put the work in. Okay, it's hard, but you got to do it. And, and spoiler alert, and this is something that, you know, people are probably glad that they hear beforehand. Once you get into the industry, it doesn't get easier. Like literally all you have done is condition yourself to expect what it's going to be like. We constantly are developing. We are constantly working. We constantly have to, because if we don't, our ability to um, deliver cyber risk reduction for our stakeholders begins to wane. There's no chilling, okay? I mean, you can have family and time off and obviously all that stuff, but it's a, it's, that's why I say it's a lifestyle. I don't know. You could, if people have, um, if people have different opinions, holler at me, but this is how I feel about it. All right. What's the work-life balance of a pen tester like? Uh, I don't know that. Um, as I'm not a pen tester, however, I will tell you this. I, I just spoke I just spoke last week to a world-class pen tester, okay? He, he's authored multiple books. He's been a pen tester for years. He is phenomenal, and he's a friend of mine, okay? I hadn't talked to him in a while, so I called him out of the blue. <clears throat> and I asked him, what's up? We talked for a while, and he was telling me about how he's working on all these different gigs. And I was like, really? Wow. And he said, yeah. And he's like, he's like it's easy, man. He's like my workflows are all pretty well defined. He's like, I've written scripts and I've automated a lot of stuff. He's like, I can just like launch it and then go chill, like go for a hike or something. And then, you know, when I come back, like a lot of the, a lot of the stuff is kind of done. And then I just bundle it up. He's like a five day engagement. I can, I can kind of crush most of it in two days. And then, you know, like slow play it. He's like, I, I'm not getting paid by the hour. I'm getting paid by the work, the engagement, the impact. And, uh, so I guess if you get good enough in one particular example, I can say that the work-life balance is wonderful because um, he he's doing it. He's demonstrating it. Now, entry level, who knows? You probably get put on an engagement. You probably get forced to do the grunt work. It's pretty common for like junior level people not to get hazed, but like the senior level people don't want to do the crappy work. So they give it to the junior people. But uh, I think pen test, if someone's a pen tester in chat, they could probably give other opinions to Warlock Sugar Daddy as, um, you know, I, I don't know. But I will say, and Jenny Housley did this, we do have Hacker Man emotes in the squad tray that hasn't been used re recently. So I'll throw that down there for Warlock Space Daddy. 
or sugar daddy. Zachary Cody. Nothing gets me going in the morning like this stream. Yes, Zachary. Hold on. Catch me outside. How about that? Yeah, there's no reason for that sound effect. I just love it, and it doesn't get used enough. Uh, did you hear about the iOS phone that Citizen Lab dubbed Blast Pass? It was being used to install NSO Group Pegasus exploit. I did not hear about that, but shall we? Shall we do a little uh, little journey here? This is two days ago. Apple patch two zero days or vulnerabilities. It doesn't say zero day. Uh, exploit change. <clears throat> All right, two zero click zero day phones. Okay, so this is a major. I appreciate you sharing this with us, Zachary. Right here is what this this one right here is what you should be losing your cookies about zero click. This means I send you a text message and I own your machine or your phone, right? Zero click is the scariest thing. You cannot stop someone from texting you from, from a random phone number. You cannot stop that, okay? With email security gateways, you might be able to stop someone from sending you an email successfully, but no one is stopping a phone call from coming in and no one is stopping a text message from coming into your mobile device. Zero click is literally one of the scariest things. And this is two zero click, zero day phones that basically would install one of the most invasive, most sophisticated spyware info stealing softwares that I know of to date onto your iPhone. Investigative journalist, boom, owned. Um, political rival, boom, owned. Somebody, I, you know, like uh, somebody uh, that I that I used to be in a relationship with that now no longer likes me, but I'm, a, I'm crazy and I'm stalking and everything else, boom, owned, right? This is scary stuff. I will say if you are running an Apple device, definitely want to update it. Again, there is something to be said here. Typically something like this, something like this is incredibly valuable. Great cash, homie. So some jabroni isn't going to like get access to this and just fire it at you. So your, your urgency to patch your phone is actually kind of lower. But if you're responsible for, um, like, I don't know, the president, the president of the United States, any Congress member, um, high ranking VIPs, celebrities, you know what I mean? Like if, if you're, if you're responsible for someone who would be a target, then, it, you know, you want to do this. I will say that Apple's pretty good about, uh, you can turn on auto updates, auto patches, who knows you were exposed for some period of time there. So check it out. Exactly. Shuttle crab says like you get the message and you hit like report junk. You already owned. It's too late. That's the problem with zero click. That is the scary part of zero click and why it's such a great cash, homie. It's such a valuable. Dude, NSO group was absolutely selling this for millions of dollars. Like zero question. That's another reason why some knucklehead isn't going to be able to get access to this because it's it's a million dollars. Like the people buying this and weaponizing it are people who are well-funded, who have an absolute, very specific objective with the weapon, okay? Thank you for sharing that, Zachary. Alex, a special work-life balance mental health episode might be helpful, Jerry. Yeah, it would be. I've got to get that Trello board going, um, but a mental health episode would be good. We've done that uh, mental health a little bit. Um, not a specific episode, but one that is um, targeted... Um, for uh, like, like in the sock and stuff like that. You know what I'm just thinking here? Like my uncle, my uncle is like a, 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 a mental health expert, but he mostly deals with drugs and um, like addiction. So I don't know if he would be a good fit, but it'd be kind of cool to have my uncle on as like a guest to talk about mental health. Maybe we could, maybe we could do a mental health episode. That'd be fun. Maybe that would be a good one for October, right? Cybersecurity Awareness Month. How about instead of like, <gasps> instead of every Cybersecurity Awareness Month being about patch your stuff and don't fall for fishes, how about we make it about Cybersecurity Industry Awareness, mental health, right? 
Okay. <clears throat> Say you have extensive knowledge in cyber and are trying to break into the field. What would you recommend you do? Oh, well, Jonathan Reed. I'm going to just say this, Jonathan, and this isn't like a... Uh, hold on one second. I'm just... I'm linking to my... This book I wrote here really quickly, which is free, by the way. So check it out. Jonathan Reed asks, I have experience with cyber. How do you, how do you break into the field? I literally wrote this book, okay? I wrote this book... The reason I, I, I make videos and the reason I document things is is literally, and this is like, it's just a reality. I get asked the same question a lot, okay? I get asked some questions once, that's fine. I, if I get asked the same question a lot of times, I document it in a video and sometimes, very rarely, if I get asked the same question a wicked lot, I'll make a book. Jonathan, this is a 10-step process in order that you can download for free that will tell you exactly what to do. You're doing some of the things already. But I will tell you, networking networking is super valuable, right? Like, yes, skills is important. Certs can be valuable. Education can be valuable. Networking is the most valuable, hands down, bar none. It's hard to give me to, for me to give you very specific tailored guidance, Jonathan, because I don't know where you are, where you're going, what your you know, what's your opinion of the BTL level one cert? So I don't know the BTL level one cert. Let's take a look at it really quickly. I have heard good things about it. Is BTL? Um, I think that's they're the they're the European folks, right? What are we doing here? Look at all these options. All right, so they have some free courses. Hold on, let me drop this. They have some free courses in here. So that's a that's a first step. That's a good that's good. So check out that. This is British. I I do know the people. I think I've worked with the people who um who do this and they are legit blue teamers. Okay? Um this is like a completely uh off the cuff analysis of this, okay? I know the people who are involved with this. They are blue teamers. They are good. Uh, the content, fundamentals, phishing, threat intel, digital forensics, sim, IR. Those are all very good. Uh, as far as the labs go, I could see they have four Splunk labs. So that's the sim. You are learning specific tech stack. Uh, autopsy is good. I don't know if they have licenses for autopsy. That'd be interesting if you're actually doing stuff. Pretty heavy on digital forensics. So Jonathan, was it Jonathan Reed earlier? Asked about law enforcement. This is some good stuff here. Um, the Hive for case management. That's an open source solution that you can do. Deep Blue CLI for event log analysis. Guys, I told you about Deep Blue C CLI or CT. It said CLI. Okay, so this is different. Deep Blue CLI, PowerShell module for threat hunting and event logs. Yeah. My initial thoughts, this is absolutely uh, dynamite and worth it. I would love to do a video on it, frankly. Warlock Sugar Daddy, thanks for the advice. If anyone wants to share some pointers on entry-level pen tester, please reach out. William Yorstead. Did we just become best friends? Yep. Yes, I love it. I love it. Uh, Warlock Sugar Daddy, while I got you here... Um, Entry level pen testing, I would just say, um, and I feel strongly about this. I, I don't know if this is going to work. TCM Academy, Heath, they do great work and they actually have um, a certification that's kind of blowing up in the industry right now. It's a little bit more advanced for, than entry level, but it's PNPT. They actually have the uh, junior level one, but PNPT is the main one. And I just want to point out here oh my God, how do we. Show me the, oh my God. Show me the. Oh. All right, I was hoping they'd have the training. Um, I was hoping they'd have the training um, thing. So here's the deal. Um, just the final thing. They have five classes, right? It, it's kind of annoying me right now. Oh my God, bro. 
They have the, the classes. I just want to show them to you. And they're in, or like, the thing is, like, I was looking for the little career path that would show you the order. But, like, basically, PEH is number one. So, uh, Warlock, Sugar Daddy, start here. This is dope. You can actually watch most of this for free on YouTube. Heath has released it. But then the next thing, once you pop a box, is doing Privesk, and he covers Windows and Linux, right? And, and Heath is a professional pen tester, so, like, this is legit content. And then once you get that, uh, oh, yeah, first you're going to do OSINT. This is just a fun class in general. I've done this class. Um, and then finally, uh, moving laterally once you've uh, escalated Privs, and then how do you actually report because pen testing isn't just about hacking boxes. Pen testing isn't bug bounty. Pen testing is delivering a service to a client. And there is a project element to it where you have to report your findings and stuff like that. So uh, they have this playbook here. And I think that they cover how to report. And then finally, the um, the the, the uh, PNPT does the reporting aspect of it as well. How are we doing on time? Six more minutes, guys. Um All right. Uh, P.S. Emmanuel Popka says, I'm currently enrolled on Cisco Cyber Ops Academy, Associate, excuse me. Would that get me in the industry? All right. So one thing I'm going to tell you, and uh, P.S., I don't know about Cisco Cyber Ops Associate. One thing I will tell you about any certification or any boot camp or any training or education in industry there are not many that are guaranteed to get you in industry. Okay? Like, this is hard truth. What it will do is, A, give you knowledge, right? And you should be going beyond the education. Okay? So if you learn something, explore it deeper. Do additional digging. It's going to serve you well. In addition, connect with the people who are your or peers. Connect with the uh, faculty. Connect with the people in the Simply Cyber community over here. Do the Simply Cyber community challenge as well, okay? While it's not guaranteed to get you a job, it will get you access to knowledge and people and network and resources. And networking is more likely to get you a job. I will tell you, Cisco Cyber Ops Associate, if that shows up on a resume, that's not like, you know, people aren't like, um, you know, like gasping and holding their heart and saying, wait a minute, we got, we got one of these on, on in the resume pile. Like, uh, like don't call anybody else back. This is who we're hiring. I'm not downplaying the value of that particular education. I don't know it. I can't evaluate it in any means. But what I'm saying is there's really not like SANS, SANS education, which is wicked expensive, um, does have some value to say, oh, they went to SANS. Um, Getting training from John Strand, like you can do next week, that has worked for some people. The the real the real benefit is to s squeeze as much value out of any program you go through, whether it's Blue Team Labs Online uh, V1 or if it's Cisco Cyber Ops Associate. Squeeze as much value as you can out of it. Connect with as many people as you can about it, and document what you learned. Not that you completed the program. Because someone like me who's doing hiring, I don't know what that program means. But if you distill the essence of the knowledge you gained and the transformation you achieved, that's valuable. I hope that helps. Um, Michael Huskin. What's up, Michael? The day has finally arrived. Today's my first day in my role as cybersecurity planning specialist. Yes, Michael Huskin, congratulations. Looks like we got a super chat from Lazaro. Thank you, Lazaro, a.k.a. Lazarus, I guess, if you translate it. Uh, hey, Dr. Osher, at what age did you start to introduce cyber to your kids? I want my sons to get interested as they get older. So, Lazaro, I've introduced cyber to my kids, um, I mean, as soon as they were old enough, like four. And I know, like, introducing cyber to kids is a very vague concept. It might mean different things to different kids. My kids have tech, right? Like iPads and stuff like that. So at a young age, they can't download apps without me authenticating to the device, right? So now they're like, now they're learning, okay, this is access control. And I explained to them, like, you can't be trusted with these things because you'll download all, this, all the dumb stuff, right? So this is, this is a control. I'm a check, right? And then as my kids get older, um, you know, one of them has a cell phone now. So now we're talking about, hey, you're going to get random calls and random text messages from random people. They're not legit. 
okay? Don't accept any calls from anyone that isn't in your phone book, which is basically like family members, right? Don't think that when you see a video online that says, oh, download, go to this link here and download for a free Fortnite skin, it's legit. It's completely crass. And I would go, I would go one step further with my kids and then take that link. I don't do this all the time, but take that link, stick it in URL scan IO or stick it in um, any dot run and show them, look at this. This is malicious, right? Nobody's giving away anything for free, right? That's how I do it. Eventually when my kids get older, I will give them an opportunity to want to get Linux hands-on training and learn what I do. I will, I will, I will gladly teach. I will, I will teach my kids everything I know if they want to learn it. The thing is, um, I can't, I'm not going to like drag them to the cybersecurity well and dunk their head in it and be like, this is the family business. You're going to learn it or not. Right. So that's, that's what's up. I, hopefully that works. I do have a 10 AM meeting. I'm going to be dropping in just a minute here. Um, John Hammond does some training videos. I love John Hammond. If you don't know John Hammond, um, he's a good guy. All right. Final one here from Alexis. Hernandez, heading to my first day on my paid trainee program. Thanks, Gerald, for the help. Hell yeah. Love it, love it, love it. Paid training. You go get it, Alexis. Very nice. All right, guys, that's going to do it for the show. Shout out to the mods. Thank you. Oh, hold on. We, th whoop. This just do, 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 do. breaking news. I just got an email. I have an interview Friday for Remote Sock 1 analyst for Kyle Murphy. Guess I'll be watching your interview videos between now and then. And again, and again, and again. Yes, Kyle Murphy, straight crushing it, homie. Kyle, don't forget on the channel. Um, don't forget on the channel. I have uh, this video. I've always got a video for that, right? I have 12 incredible sock analyst interview questions and examples. Uh, that should do you well, okay? So straight up, Kyle, good luck. I would also encourage you, Kyle, to take one story from the Daily Cyber Threat Briefing this week. Think about it. Think about what you might do differently and be prepared to casually fold it into the conversation and blow them away. I wish you the very best, Kyle. Guys, I'm Jerry, your chat. This has been Simply Cyber's Daily Cyber Threat Briefing extended version, jaw jacking. Thank you all so very much. Be good. And until next time, stay secure. Everybody, I hope you enjoyed that content. Keep the cybersecurity train going by connecting with the other Simply Cyber community resources. We have the Discord server that's lively and always keeps the conversation going. You can connect with me directly on LinkedIn. And also every single weekday morning on the Simply Cyber channel, we're doing live daily cyber threat briefings, 8 a.m. Eastern time, as well as Thursday at 4.30 p.m. We're doing live stream interviews with industry experts, and we produce videos that we push out every Wednesday morning. I'm Jerry.